What does it mean to be human? What is value, purpose, life? These questions are only some of what Nier Automata begins to challenge us with as we dredge through its machine-riddled world. The game tasks itself with delivering the series' most complex and thought-provoking ideas. This is already a high order, but it piles on the responsibility of trying to create interesting characters for us to follow, an in-depth world for us to play in, and compelling gameplay that will keep us engaged. Automata somehow manages to do all of this and tie it into a fine little package. The game is the series' best so far. Though some of the other entries do certain things better, Automata is the best overall that Taro, the game's director, has to offer. With Platinum Games behind the controls, the game feels better than ever. Combat is smooth, it's fast, quick-paced, and varied. The story has depth, personality, and style. By the end of the tale, we will be questioning our own beliefs, now given the perspective of another's, and given the environment to properly tear down the validity of those ideals. We'll be left with a blank slate, a fresh perspective. One that the game does not force upon us, but one that we arrive at on our own. Near Automata is a special thing, one that doesn't come around very often. A game that was a clear effort to make something unique and the best efforts of everyone involved. The creators genuinely wanted to make something good, not just in story, character, theme, or structure, but in every way they possibly could. So that's what I want to take a look at today. We'll be looking at Near Automata, talking about gameplay, story, mechanics, and everything in between. If you haven't seen my previous videos on the Drakengard slash Nier series, I would recommend going to watch those videos now. It isn't 100% necessary, but it will help with the context of the world and the development of the series up to this point. If you enjoy the video and would like to support the channel, you can do so easily by liking the video and subscribing. This really helps me out and ensures that I can keep making videos like this in the future. You can also subscribe to me on Patreon, where I provide early access to my videos, scattered text post updates, and longer versions of my full series retrospectives. You can also follow me on Twitch, where I play games that I'm not currently reviewing. Spoilers for Near Automata. Hey Dad, it's me, your favorite son, and today I'd like to talk about Near Automata. After the development and release of Nier, Yoko Taro and series producer Yosuke Saito immediately wanted to make another entry in the series. The hopes for the sequel were quickly dashed by Yuki Yokohama, the assistant producer, who did not want to work on the next game because of the low sales of the first one. Despite this, Nier was well received among fans. This led Square Enix to greenlight another entry in the series. The original staff was on board as well, but wanted to have a more action-oriented gameplay and better combat systems in general for the next game. This was based on the feedback that fans gave about the first game's slow and less varied combat. The action could definitely be better, and to this end, Taro and his team decided to work with Platinum Games on this entry. Platinum Games is known for developing action games. They're known for quick, speedy, and responsive combat, specifically on games like The Wonderful 101, Metal Gear Rising Revengeance, and Bayonetta. Platinum wanted to provide Automata with a much speedier and polished battle system compared to the previous entries in the series. They began by taking the combat system of Nier and expanding upon it, while also trying to stay true to the original. Taro had felt that working with Platinum gave them the ability to make the best game that they could. Despite this, Taro had difficulties adjusting to working with Platinum. The team had a 9.30am start time, and this almost caused the project to be cancelled because Taro couldn't wake up that early. One of the larger concepts for the game was to nudge the player in the right direction, but give them the freedom to make the wrong or right choices. This even extended to the story, where there was no wrong or right choice. Taro felt that it was up to the players to decide how to frame the narrative in their heads. To this end, Taro tried to not think about themes too much when writing Automata. He wanted the players to create and interpret themes out of what he had given them. 
In comparison to Nier, Taro felt that the first game was more of a wet kind of story, where Automata was much more dry, depicting the unfairness of the world and the harsh realities of life. Emmy Evans would return to work on the game's soundtrack, as well as Kaichi Okabe, working with Monica once again. This time around, the team stuck with the melancholy feeling that they achieved with Nier, but wanted a more industrial feel to the songs. Akihiko Yoshida worked on character design this time through, replacing DK, who did the character designs on the first Nier. He joined the project later than others, and Taro generally didn't give direction on character design, but because of the late start, he pushed Yoshida in the direction of sleek designs with a dominant black color. Nier Automata was delayed to prevent launching around other games that might affect its sales. This gave the team more time to polish systems and remove bugs. Nier Automata was released in Japan for the PlayStation 4 on February 23rd, 2017, and in North America on March 7th, 2017. A few notes before we get into things. The first is on the platform that I played Nier Automata on. I played Automata on the PlayStation 5. This was mostly because of its ease and availability of recording. The game ran mostly great, though I still did get a couple crashes through my around 60 hours of playtime on the game. It did achieve good frame rates, though, and I never noticed any drops or issues. The game itself does have some problems with texture pop-in, but it's something really unnoticeable unless you're paying a ton of attention. The second note is on the structure of this review. If you've seen my previous videos on the Drakengard or Nier series or played any of these games, then you'll know that Yoko Taro is a fan of multiple endings. Automata, of course, follows this trend, but the multiple endings, aside from two, are really just different stop-off points of the same timeline. It really ends up being a continuation of the main game, but because some of the endings show different perspectives and see us playing other characters, I will be splitting each one up into different sections. We'll first go through the main route of the game, ending A, and then venture back to talk about each of the other endings. I will talk about some of the joke endings in the game, but not every single one, as there are a total of 21 joke endings in the total tale. Near Automata begins with our main character speaking to us. We are told that life is cyclical, that it is a never-ending cycle. Our character, though, takes a cynical approach to this cycle, and vengeful disposition towards the one that has placed them into this cycle. We are taking part in an attack on Earth, on the machines that inhabit the planet. We are tasked with piloting one of the ships that is participating in this mission. This introduces us to the first of the many different types of gameplay that Nier Automata will offer. Like its predecessor, the game doesn't shy away from switching things up and shifting the combat of the game in a different direction. But this time, it isn't just different angles and views, it's a complete change in elements. I love this type of variety. It truly keeps the player engaged and makes us feel constantly in control of the situations happening to us. We feel, again, as if we are the character rather than a player controlling a video game. As we try to avoid and survive the onslaught of anti-air systems on Earth, our entire squadron begins to go down around us. We are the last one left, and we get a very stylish and awesome scene where our main character jumps out of their machine and heads towards the ground. This is 2B and who we will be controlling for the beginning portion of the game. We are tasked with destroying a large group of machines that are ready to tear us limb from limb. I suppose that now is a good time as any to talk about the combat of Nier Automata. The core of Automata is very much the same as Nier. We can of course do light and heavy attacks, swapping them in and out to pull off different combos. We can also use our pod to shoot enemies a la Grimoire Vice, and this is really the bread and butter of most of our combat. We can also equip programs to our pod that are a more powerful type of action that will have a cooldown each time we use them. These can be large bombs, shields that we can equip to defend us from attacks, or massive powerful blows to the enemy forces. Of course, because it's a Drakenir game, we have a ton of weapons at our disposal. We can find many throughout the game and they each function differently. Each have their own weight, attack, animations, and combos. As we upgrade these weapons through the system that we'll gain access to very early in the game, we'll also gain access to more abilities with those weapons, speed upgrades, deflecting enemy projectiles, and even store discounts. 
This is one of the strongest parts of Automata's system, and one of the parts that isn't talked about enough. It has a ton of variety in combat and choice, but a lot of that variety can't be seen from the surface. We can actually equip a weapon in our light slot and our heavy slot, binding each to their respective buttons. Each weapon combination will have a different combo based on where they're equipped and what upgrade level they're at. Multiplying this by all of the weapons available in the game gives us a massive variety in combos and attacks. Now, of course, this isn't necessary to use in the game unless we're playing on a higher difficulty. The game can easily be completed by just using simple combos and introductory weapons, but for the interested player that decides to delve deeper, there's a lot of fun to be had here. I should also note that one of my favorite visual parts of the system is that our weapons float on our back due to a system that the androids use. Swapping in and out of weapons looks very cool and adds a ton of style to combat in general. The whole game is very subtly flashy. It's reserved, but also as gaudy as it wants to be. The other huge system that makes its debut in Automata is Chips. The chip system acts as a replacement for words. In Nier, we could equip words to alter our stats and change the way our weapons or abilities worked. In Automata, we can equip chips to do the same thing. In Nier, these upgrades felt pretty small and mostly unnoticeable. In Automata, this is the exact opposite. Chips will make or break a battle and can completely change the way that the game is played. We begin the game with our basic chips equipped, the ones that give us access to our HUD and damage meters on enemies. This is also a nice touch because these can actually be taken out. Taro specifically wanted this in the game because he wanted to give players the ability to mess up. He trusted players to know what to do and gives them the freedom to explore these systems fully. Each chip takes up a certain amount of slots on a board that sits off to the right. When equipping a chip, it will give us some sort of stat boost. There are a lot of different chips in the game. Basic stat upgrades like experience, HP, weapon attack, ranged attack. But the system extends itself into more complex abilities like Last Stand that increases our damage when low on health, or Shockwave which adds a blast to our weapon attacks, or Auto Heal which replenishes our health after a few seconds of not taking damage. All of these chips can be fused with others to increase their potency all the way up to plus 8. With the massive variety in chips in the game and abilities at our disposal, there is a huge amount of room to play around with the system and see what works. You will not only see, but feel a huge difference between equipping a bad chipset and one that just melts all of the enemies in front of you. It's a great system and just works so well. There's also the scarcity that's introduced. We only have so much space here since each chip takes up a certain amount of space. Therefore, we can't just upgrade everything to the max and become the most powerful fighter ever. We have to think about how much space we have and sacrifice certain things for others. In Automata, I really chose a damage-focused chipset, trying to max out exactly how much damage I could do and not focusing on HP or defense. This changed my playstyle for the entire game because when things got really hard, I had to just not get hit. There was no second line of defense that made it so I could take a brutish approach. I had to be fast and have quick reflexes. But you could absolutely make a safer build, one where you take things slow and whittle enemies down over time, but that's just no fun. There's also a massive amount of enemy variety in Automata, something that hasn't truly been present in the series. There was some show of this in Nier, but Automata is where it really starts to shine through. Small robots, big robots, electric robots, all manner of robots. The whole combat system just works though. Dodging has an incredibly tactile feel. The combination of the animation, sound design, and gameplay makes evading an enemy's attacks just so satisfying to pull off. It isn't incredibly difficult, as it can be spammed near infinitely, but the picture that we get of flipping out of the way of a shot or ducking a massive sword swing just always gives us a boost in our combat confidence. The scale of the world and enemies also lends to making the system feel amazing. We contend with massive foes, huge machines that really make us feel small in the world. Not to mention we're always walking around towering skyscrapers or deserts that run as far as the eye can see. 
When we feel small, we have to be able to do big things. We have to be able to match ourselves with these towering giants, and when we fell them, it feels all the better. Automata's combat is not just a great system that works well with its parts, it's also a part of everything that came before it. Only when we have journeyed through the Drakenir series can we see the bones of the previous games inside of Automata. We can only see how this game could be possible once we have seen those. Every single game that came before was a stepping stone. It created a path to something great. Sure, there were missteps along the way, ankles got twisted, toes got stubbed, but it was all in favor of creating Automata, the pinnacle of the series gameplay in every possible way. The systems do also change slightly based on the character that we're playing, but since we won't be playing those characters for a bit, we'll talk about those later. As 2B, we destroy the approaching machines and we are attacked by a massive machine arm, the Marks. Since we're still really in the tutorial for the game, it's a very simple fight as we just have to dodge its lunges and wait for an opening. We can actually destroy the teeth on the boss, taking them away one by one. When we win the fight, the enemy isn't yet destroyed. Someone else comes in and finishes it off. This is 9S, who will act as our companion for the game. For a little bit of backstory, 2B and 9S are androids. They are a part of Yorha, soldiers that are dedicated to fight for humanity. Earth is now mostly desolate, invaded by machines sent by a race of aliens. Because of this invasion, humans have been sent to the moon, forced to evacuate their homeworld. As Yorha, we fight for the humans in a massive war to take back their planet. 2B is really just a unit and type designation, Unit 2, Type B, as is 9S. The story itself actually takes place thousands and thousands of years after the events of Nier, which explains the highly advanced technology that we're seeing. 9S heads out to search around the perimeter, and 2B heads into the facility. Inside of the facility, we find out that the machines have been using the factory to begin reproducing and manufacturing more machines. If we don't destroy the place, they'll just keep coming. We also begin to hear a voice over the loudspeaker, but 9S says the machines have just repurposed information from the old world. There's no purpose behind what the machines do. It's just recycled information. It's just accessing random, nonsensical data from the old world. There's no actual meaning behind it. As we head outside of the facility, we find a massive bridge ahead. 9S says the intel he has says there is another facility down the way. Before we can head across though, we have another boss fight against two marks. We do mostly the same thing, just dodging more as to avoid the attacks from both bosses. After the fight, the machines move out of the way, and a massive goliath appears, using the saw machines as arms. We begin a huge fight, avoiding projectile fire and massive mammoth slams from the Goliath's weapon hands. The machine pushes us back toward the facility, but eventually 9S begins to help out. He uses his suit to deflect an attack that's about to kill us and is knocked out on top of the machine. We take this opportunity to walk up the boss, fighting smaller enemies as we go. 9S is unconscious above and we come to his rescue, defending him from the onslaught of machines. Our pod recommends against trying to repair him as 9S is in critical condition. He tells us to leave him, and he offers us his flight unit. We use the flight suit to attack the machine in another shooter section. We eventually sever its arm and use it as our own weapon. 2B launches a final attack, but is launched back on top of the Goliath. The situation for the two androids seems pretty dire, and they choose to execute any android's last-ditch effort. They use their black boxes, a sort of core that exists at the center of every android, and self-destruct, destroying the approaching Goliaths in the process. As 2B once again, we wake back up on the bunker, a floating space station that acts as Yorha headquarters. When an android's body is destroyed, sometimes their memories and personality can be uploaded to a new body on the bunker, allowing them to continue on as if nothing happened. This was the case for 2B this time, but not entirely for 9S. His memories were uploaded, but not entirely. He can only remember up until the rendezvous. 9S heads off a little different than when we last met him. We then get a bit of backstory from Yorha itself, the official history, so to speak, spurring the android's signature salute, 
glory to mankind. We then have a calibration session for the new body with 9S, one where we actually have to interact with the menus, adjusting our brightness, our volume, most of our settings. The whole sequence is being recorded, by the way, something that we'll see has a more interesting point much later. 9S is a scanner unit and is in charge of our maintenance from now on. He regularly calls us ma'am, but 2B tells him to not be so formal. We then head to talk to the commander who has some choice words for the risky move we pulled off down on Earth. She also has a new mission for us to head back to Earth and meet up with the resistance efforts on the planet below. There already is a dedicated contact for the resistance, but they've gone dark. There's also something not quite right because 2B is a combat model. Recon should be a job for 9S. We contend with another shooting section and some more flying machines as we make our way planetside. We get our first view of the world below, at least the open environments that we'll be seeing for most of the game. This is another huge upgrade from the previous entries in the series. The first pro that Automata has over its predecessor is that its environments are particularly large scale. They often make us feel small in their presence. Though this world is desolate, long forgotten, mostly inhabited by machines, its massive towering skyscrapers stand tall above us. Not only does this properly give us a wake-up call, a smack in the face to tell us that we are nothing in the face of the things that came before us, it is also a constant reminder of the world that was lost. It's a warning a danger sign. It never lets us forget what our enemies have done to the humans, the ones that we fight for. The world itself is a reason to fight. The environments also have a freshness breathed into them, a new life. The variety in areas gives each its own distinct and unique identity. The amusement park that we'll visit soon is a dark place, but lit up by street lights and fireworks off in the distance, and the characters that inhabit it leave a sinister vibe in the background. The desert is a massive wandering wasteland. It's a remnant of the past, something that used to exist here long before. The forest kingdom is a wooded maze with rolling trees and waterfalls as far as the eye can see. All of these places have great designs. They look beautiful and they feel like history as we walk through them. They also have story implications and there's more lore to be had here, but we'll get to that later. Traveling around the world, we can actually use transporters. These will allow us to save our game, check emails, and fast travel around the world. The fast travel system isn't available right from the get-go, but it is incredibly useful once we get it, especially since the open world, quote-unquote, in Automata, requires taking some specific and narrow pathways to travel from one area to the next. Speaking of transporters, we should also talk about the way that death works in Automata. When we die, we don't just start back from a checkpoint. Our body actually stays where we died, and we have to take our new body back there to regain our items, experience, and chips. If we die while trying to gather our stuff, we lost all of it. This is an incredible pain, and while it doesn't happen often and it isn't very hard to get our equipment back, it's still tedious. I will say that I never once lost all of my equipment. I never died on my way to get to my previous body, but I still don't think the mechanic really fits in with the game, at least in terms of gameplay. I will say though that thematically, and as far as the story goes, it fits very well. Of course, it ties in with the narrative that when androids' bodies are destroyed, their personality and memories are transferred over. But it also fits in with the idea, or rather the question, of what makes you, you. You've lost your body, transferred to another one, your broken corpse lies on the battlefield. Was that you, or is this you? Or is the thing that was you transferred over? What part of us, or these androids, makes them the person that persists? Eventually, we arrive at the Resistance camp and meet its leader, Anemone. She gives us free reign to ask the Resistance members around the camp for information. Each of these people give us a small side quest to complete so that we can open up their services. The weapons dealer repairs equipment from the old world and needs his tools fixed. The strange Resistance woman is, well, strange and will answer some questions we have about the game. And the supply trader needs materials to be able to sell plug-in chips. Once we head out to complete these small tasks, Operator 6O contacts us. She is the operator in control of 2B and will check in regularly on our status. As we're completing tasks, 9S also begins to complain about the monotony of the jobs. This is clearly a normal complaint, just a general statement to make while doing boring work, but 2B doesn't share this sentiment. This is what they were meant to do, and they shouldn't complain about doing it. 
Once we head back to the camp, Anemone tells us that there have been reports of dangerous machines in the desert. It could be a sign of something more sinister, so she wants us to head out there and meet with the Resistance contacts in the sand-filled valley. We head through the city and make our way to the desert. On the way, we get a message from the Council of Humanity. This is a morale boost broadcast, one meant to rally the androids, to inspire something in them to fight harder and win the war against the machines. The Council of Humanity has a message for all of our brave androids fighting on the surface. Currently, our struggle against the machine life force is at a stalemate. This battle has raged for far too long. I am sure all of you find the effort grueling. But now is not the time to give up. Now, more than ever, we must forge on. Remember that several hundred thousand humans on the moon want nothing more than to return to Earth. Glory to mankind. In the desert, we find a woman named Jackass. She's a resistance soldier that opens the way into the desert using explosives. In the desert, we find some interesting machines, ones wearing very familiar masks if you played the first Nier game. We destroy a few groups of machines and find one machine that runs away from battle. Certainly odd behavior for a machine. Our pod marks the target and we chase it further into the desert, finding an abandoned apartment complex inside. We're forced to destroy some larger machines while chasing the cowardly one. We eventually find a large structure in the ground, or rather a caved-in building located deep within the desert. The machines inside seem to be housing children that they're rocking in cribs. This doesn't make sense because the machines shouldn't be able to raise children or bear them. They don't even have feelings. They're just imitating humans, but this doesn't make it any less unsettling when we begin slaughtering them. After destroying hordes of them, the remaining machines begin to crawl and form a larger hole. From this formation, a man falls out, or rather, an android, or is it machine? We aren't entirely sure, but we have to fight it. As we begin to deal damage, it starts to level up, evolving its abilities throughout the battle, and its capability to speak. The battle gets harder and harder until we eventually defeat it, running the mystery machine through with a sword. From the machine's corpse, another one is spawned. This one is angry though, and its shouts begin to collapse the room around us. It seems to grieve its fallen brother, and we make our escape. Once we get outside, we tell command about the oddity that we just encountered, and 9S uploads the data from our fight to the bunker. Once back in the city ruins, we return to the camp to speak with Anemone. She offers us a room at the camp while our mission continues. We can sleep in here and take a rest from the wastelands outside. Once we leave the city, 9S's operator tells us that we have a message from the commander. They've lost contact with some androids on the surface. Their black boxes are online though, so we need to head out and look for them. We have to head through some nearby sewers and make our way into the amusement park. Here, the machines are mimicking clowns and attendants of the attractions. Heading deeper into the park, we're confronted with a tank, one with mounted turrets shooting massive waves of projectiles in every direction. These are separate parts of the boss and can be destroyed. The tank itself will also try to ram us and directly attack us. The fight is still pretty simple though, and defeating the boss will give us a machine core. These are the things that make up the center of the machine, similar in structure to a plant cell. They can be sold for quite a bit of money at the local vendors. We then have to stand on top of a roller coaster defending ourselves from the enemies attacking us. While fighting off the machines, 9S tells 2B that it would be alright if she called him Nines. This is what people usually call him, and is a lot less formal, but 2B's reserved nature keeps her from doing this. The roller coaster drops us off inside the main building of the park, the Opera House. Inside, a massive machine, Beauvoir, begins a battle with us. The bosses in Automata are usually very well themed. Their attacks reflect the area that they're in and the personality of the boss itself. It's something that the game does very well, and Beauvoir's singing ring attacks reflect this. She will bombard us with missiles, shoot projectiles, and shoot out piercing sonic rings from her body. As the fight progresses, we eventually get attacked by one of these rings, forcing us to play a small mini-game to stop the hack. Beauvoir then summons the corpses of the lost androids, or what we at first think are corpses. It turns out they're actually alive and have been turned into weapons that will attack us. 
We have to defeat our corrupted brethren while also fending off the boss trying to kill us. After a long battle, we destroy the boss. Tubi's pod blasts a hole through its center, and we see a quick flash of Beauvoir and something else. We check the androids nearby, and they can't be recovered. They were being kept alive by the machine. 9S points out afterwards that the machine that we just fought had some odd things to say. It seems like the machine actually had emotion, but 2B dismisses this. As 9S himself said, the machines can't have emotions. As we head outside, a machine waves a white flag and invites us into the village. It thanks us for destroying the broken machine and we follow it ahead. It opens a secret passage in the park that leads into the forest. As we head deeper inside, we see a resupply operation being executed, sending components up to the bunker and the moon. 2B also posits an interesting thought here. Why haven't the aliens attacked the bunker directly, or the moon, since they came from outer space in the first place? But 9S doesn't really have a good answer. When we arrive at the machine village, all of the residents are waving white flags. The leader of the village, Pascal, tells us that they are not our enemies. He tells us to talk to the people in his village and see that they are not hostile. Here we can actually begin to gather side quests. There are many side quests throughout the game, and a good majority of them are actually pretty good. Of course, just like Nier, some of them can be unnecessary and a slog, but far fewer than the previous game. There are actually genuinely good stories here that will color our interpretation of the world. There is a lot of them though, and they work better when viewed with story developments in hindsight, so we'll be talking about them in a bit. Pascal actually reveals that he already deals with the resistance camp. They make trades sometimes because they both need supplies, and have entered into some sort of peace deal. He wants us to deliver something to Anemone. As we head back, Operator 6O contacts 2B to complain about relationship issues. Another operator she likes turned her down. Of course, 2B thinks this is trivial and has nothing to do with the mission at hand. Once we reach Anemone, we deliver the fuel filter. She gives us a viscous oil to take back to Pascal and confirms that they have been trading with the village because they're harmless. Pascal then begins directly transmitting to 2B and 9S. 9S immediately dismisses Pascal because he doesn't have a heart. He clearly thinks machines are not to be trusted and are different than androids, something separate, something lesser. When we bring the oil back to Pascal, 9S even says that androids and machines will never live peacefully together. Just then we hear an explosion and our operator tells us that a Goliath-class enemy has been spotted in the ruins. 9S thinks this must have been a trap orchestrated by the machines in Pascal's village, but he denies this. When we head over to the ruins, the place has been covered in a gray overcast. We have to make our way to new flight units that have been deployed to us from Yorha. On our way, we're stopped by a Goliath, which holds a similar fight to the one from before, but now we can actually defeat it. We take out another Goliath in a shooting exchange, but it begins to recharge. This causes a massive explosion and levels half the city, leaving a crater in its wake. We then see the commander say that the aliens, the ones on the other side of the war, that haven't revealed themselves in hundreds of years, have been hiding underground. When we land back on the ground, we're tasked with heading to the signal that we've detected from the aliens. Data collection is top priority. Of course, the city has now been drastically changed. There's a massive crater where the center of the ruins used to be. A new enemy type spawns here, possibly the most annoying one in the entire game. The linked sphere type machine is like a floating snake. It will shoot projectiles at us and weave its way around the battlefield. It tries to cut off our path and its only weak point is the lit up sphere that moves around the length of its body. Like I said, they're very annoying and I mostly tried to avoid them until I absolutely had to fight. With the crater, a new passageway has opened up in the center of the city. The passage connects to a cave network below. Once we venture into the caves, we find advanced technology. Inside, we realize it is a creation of the aliens, but they are dead inside, and their motherships are destroyed. The aliens are gone and have been dead for a while. Two of the machines from earlier show up at this point, Adam and Eve. They tell us that centuries ago, the machines overtook the aliens. They are capable of evolution, becoming aware and growing stronger. At a certain point, the machines grew smarter and stronger than their creators. Adam and Eve think humans are an enigma, and they want to unravel the mystery of their species. They want us to help them, to bring the humans out from the moon and let them dissect and analyze the creatures. While we learn this information, we fight Adam and Eve. We can't really win this battle, as it is possible to destroy them, but they just immediately come back. Once the two realize we won't join their side, they disappear. 
2B and 9S head to the bunker, and on the way we gain access to the fast travel system that we talked about before. Once we talk to the commander and report what we found on Earth, she tells us that the Council needs time to formulate a new plan. Our new mission is to gather information on Pascal. He's a unique individual, and getting data on these types is essential for the mission. We eventually talk to Pascal, who wants us to investigate the Forest Kingdom for him. This is a nearby area that is swarmed with machines protecting the area from outsiders. To get there, we have to head through a facility that seems like it was a mall or a shopping center at some point. Machines attack us and we destroy them, but one of their heads rolls off, and inside is Emil, who is very confused. If you neglected to watch my previous video on Nier, this character is a big part of that game. It's not entirely necessary to know who he is, just know he was a child who was turned into a weapon and given the power of petrification and sacrificed himself to save his friends before accepting his sister's body to stay in the mortal world. See? Super simple. Emil rolls away quickly though, opening the way for us to move forward. We head into the forest kingdom to find the machines acting strange. Most of them are armored and mimicking ancient human battle formations. Once we make our way further in, we find a castle at the center of the forest. This gives us a side-scrolling section where we have to weave through the massive halls of this fallen structure. Once we reach the top room, we find a baby machine lying in a bassinet, and 9S posits that this is their king. Just then, A2 arrives, another android that's gone rogue. She attacks us, beginning our next boss battle. She is pretty strong and fast. Most of our large attacks constitute moving off-screen and flashing back by dropping from above or from the side. These are easily dodged, though, and we can get a lot of damage on her once she recovers from them. Once we get her health down far enough, 9S asks why she betrayed Yorha. She tells him that Command is the one who betrayed them. We head after her as she runs away, but we lose her. The commander tells us that A2 is incredibly powerful and we should try and keep our distance moving forward. She won't tell us why A2 deserted Yorha in the first place though, classified information. 9S suggests asking Pascal for more information on A2. We head off to his village where we transfer the data of our battle with A2 to him. He doesn't tell us much, only that she's dangerous and has never visited the village. 2B is disappointed that 9S wanted to question Pascal without contacting Command. Operator 6 then checks in once again, and she tells us about flowers she was researching. She seems obsessed with Earth life, since she's all cooped up in the bunker. A particular flower caught her eye, though, the Lunar Tear. We can actually find a Lunar Tear back in the commercial facility, which will cause Emil to arrive and jog his memories a bit. Emil has gained a new body, one attached to a vehicle. He asks us to look for more of these flowers. Each one we find jogs Emil's memories a bit more. He recalls things that seem to have happened in Nier, but also fighting against the aliens to save Earth. There was something he wanted to protect. During this fight, Emil created multiples of himself to help with the battle. Once we find the last flower, Emil tells us we helped him remember a special place, a place that was special to him, not Emil, someone else. We can then visit this place via an elevator in the commercial area. Downstairs, we find the special place, covered in lunar tears. It seems to be Kaine's home. Emil then tells us his backstory. He was created to be a weapon. He copied himself to fight off the aliens. This Emil is just one of many Emils. As more were created, the memories of the original began to fade away. This Emil doesn't even know where the original is. There were so many that they just became one mind in the end. This is actually a side quest in the game and not part of the main story, but it clearly holds such significance, I decided to talk about it now, and it's obviously a huge link to the previous game. Emil is a special character as well, because he isn't just a person in the story, he's also a vendor. Now that he has his little roaming car, we can find him circling around the city ruins. He will spawn randomly at multiple different locations, or not at all. He will either sell materials or chips. These can be of varying quality based on the location that Emil spawns. He is incredibly useful though because he can sell us some very high quality chips that will increase our build greatly for quite a while. Eventually we head over to the flooded city, an area that's characterized by its, well, city that's flooded. We fight some machines in the area and a massive one has been spotted off in the distance. We're asked to provide backup and are sent in flight units. We have a pretty long shooting sequence here, destroying waves of enemies and even some small mini-bosses in the sky. Just then, the massive machine in the water is sighted. It's immune to our attacks, so 9S and 2B make their way to the back of the machine. 
We target its weak point, destroying it and ideally leaving the machine vulnerable. But when it's attacked, we realize that there's an electromagnetic barrier across its entire body. A hunter squadron shows up and tells us to back off, that they can take it from here. We head out and we use a gunner to assist from the ground. The railgun can be shot into its mouth three times. The being seems destroyed, but then it rises out of the water, showing that this was only the tip of the iceberg. Pascal comes to our aid with safety and information. This machine is an ancient weapon, one that Pascal remembers from the machine network. We once again begin attacking its weak points, and a missile launch destroys the weapon. A massive explosion wipes out our vision. The commander tells 2B and 9S to hold on. We wake up in the flooded city. Operator 6O contacts us to tell us that the machine was downed, but the EMP strike caused communications to go out in the local areas. 9S is currently lost, but there's a faint black box reading in the area. We need a dynamic scanner to track down 9S. When we head back to the camp, Anemone introduces us to some red-haired androids that are just back from a mission. The two are Devila and Popola, twin androids, ones that we'll be very familiar with if you played near. They give us a scanner, a new pod program that we can equip. This will replace our special attack on one of our pods, but it is incredibly useful. The scanner will detect nearby hidden items that we can find throughout the world, and there are a lot of them. We can use it to find a still-alive android that saw 9S falling during the battle. We can head to his location, which leads us underground, near the area where we found the dead aliens. We find ourselves in a strange space, completely white and constructed under the earth. Deep within, we find Adam. He tells us that he is incredibly interested in humans. He created this area to try and understand humans more. His goal is to learn and adopt every facet of humanity. In this search, Adam realized that humanity is made up of conflict, to kill and fight. Adam is a machine and exists on their network, making him basically immortal. He has no concept of death, but here he wants to risk himself in battle, to make himself more human. He has severed his connection to the network to make himself more vulnerable. This city is one of many areas I created out of a desire to understand, to know humans. It's grand, don't you think? Almost spiritual. And yet it's currently nothing more than an android graveyard. This battle has multiple phases and can be kind of a difficulty spike for the game. If we have the right chips equipped though, it won't be too hard. There is one aspect of combat that I didn't really talk about before though, and that's Taunt. Taunt was incredibly useful to me in my playthrough and is something that the game doesn't really specifically teach you until way further in. As 2B and later 9S, we can mash the left stick to turn our flashlight on and off. This will taunt enemies, increasing their damage taken and our damage taken. We can increase this damage by equipping chips, allowing us to just melt enemies before us. I used this in the battle with Adam, and it helped curve to this little difficulty spike. Further into the battle, Adam is enjoying himself. He reveals that he has 9S captured, impaled by blocks. He's seemingly trying to give 2B a reason to fight. He aims to become human through true battle, through hate. Once we defeat Adam, 2B runs him through with her sword. Again, since he was disconnected from the network, he truly dies. There's nothing after this. So dark. So cold. 2B rescues 9S, picking him up and taking him out of the mysterious place as it crumbles around them. We arrive back at the resistance camp, and Command wants to speak with us. The commander says Adam was responsible for managing half of the network. Destroying him should be a massive blow to the machines. 9S is in recovery, undergoing a full memory overhaul. The commander then wants us to gather more intel on the machines that are disconnected from the network. We then contact Pascal about new behaviors among the machines. He says that he was contacted recently by machines disconnected from the network. They are planning to build a colony of their own in the abandoned factory. We have to meet up with Pascal at the factory to find the machines. Inside, we find out that they are dressed strangely in a sort of ritual or spiritual garb. The leader of the machines tries to bow to us, but his head falls off. The machines think that he has become a god and start to go crazy. His wondrous grace has become a god. His grace is a god. His 
wondrous grace has become a god. Become a god. His wondrous grace has become a god. Become a god. We as well shall become as gods. Become as gods. We as well shall become as gods. Become as gods. We destroy them and head out. On the other side, 9S has taken control of a machine to help us through the facility. We have to make our way through this place, mostly a massive side-scrolling section, defeating hordes of enemies as we push on. Eventually, we reach an area with a massive machine, spider-like, with four legs. We can't attack it, though, because it has a shield. 9S hacks in and takes out its shield, helping us to defeat the thing. We take out its legs and destroy it, and as we head outside, the machines have begun to plunge themselves into the lava in the factory. They think that sacrificing themselves will make them gods. Outside, we see Eve grieving the death of his brother Adam. As we head back towards the resistance camp, we can't seem to get into contact with the bunker. At the camp, the machines have turned into ravenous beasts and have begun eating the members of the resistance. We defeat the machines, and an enemy thanks us for helping her. Outside, we fight another huge boss with an electric shield called Bokushi. Once we defeat the boss, Eve shows up and small machines form a shield around him. We have to defeat him by getting rid of the shield and dealing direct damage. He isn't completely destroyed because he forms a massive snake of machines that flies throughout the ruins. We have to destroy this once again, and Eve heads to the crater. He waits for us there for our final battle. He tells us that the world is meaningless, clearly grief-stricken from the loss of Adam. Because of his loss, he must destroy the world and us. Eve is very strong, and we have to deal tons of damage on him while not getting hit by his incredibly quick attacks. We also have to chase him onto platforms to hurt him. Eventually, he begins to sap the life force of the beings around him, regenerating his health. 9S decides to hack into Eve, though, and cut him off from the network. 9S distracts him, and we cut through his arm. We can attack Eve directly, but 2B is heavily damaged during the fight. We have to destroy the last part of him as she limps around the battlefield. Once he's destroyed, he calls out for his brother as 2B ends his life. We then see 9S has red eyes. Something is wrong. He was corrupted when Eve lost his connection to the network. 9S says it's fine because he can access his backup data from the bunker, but 2B doesn't want that. He'll lose the part of him that makes him 9S. He'll lose the you that he is right now. 9S realizes that there is no other way. He needs 2B to kill him. She puts her hands around his throat and takes the life from him. It's a long, sad, and torturous scene as 2B weeps over his body, a personal and emotional sequence, delivering a lot in the way of feeling. Just then, 2B sees that machine heads all over have begun flashing green. A nearby machine crawls out of the wreckage, but it's 9S. He left his personal data on the machine side. He gives a long-winded technical explanation, but 2B is just glad that he's alive. This is the first ending to Near Automata, Flowers for Machines. The first playthrough is great. It develops the world, introduces the characters, and it gives us an important base to work off of. It's a compelling story, one that makes us want to learn more, but like I said before, this is really just the beginning. With ending A, we haven't even seen half of what the game has to offer. It doesn't really matter that the credits are rolling here. They could have easily just stuck a chapter end screen here, and we could have moved on to the next part of the story. Nier Automata is also much more clear about this fact with the player. We get a screen after beating it that strongly encourages that we play through the game again to see what else there is to offer. Ending B actually sees us playing through the same story, but from the perspective of 9S. This is a huge upgrade from Nier, and was really what I felt that game needed. One of the biggest complaints that I and a lot of other people had with Nier was that it could be a bit repetitive. There was an amazing story there, a spectacular one, but it took some grinding and some work to find. Here, each playthrough and ending will actually give us a unique experience and rarely sees us retreading old ground. We will have to fight a few of the same bosses again, but it's never something that makes us feel like we're playing the exact same experience over. It always feels new. This playthrough begins with a machine begging its brother to wake up. We have to play as the machine for a moment, grabbing a bucket of oil to try and revive the dead companion. This is clearly incredibly sad, seeing this being, one that clearly does not yet understand death, try to fight against the natural tidal wave that is the afterlife, only to fail, is miserable. Brother. 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 Please. 
Start moving. Brother. 9S views this with much less emotion, though, as he is watching over the situation from a crane. He sees 2B's group heading down to Earth and is told by his operator to disable the defense systems of the base so they can make their way in. 9S has a different operator in his playthrough, Operator 210. As we saw in 2B's playthrough, her operator was very bubbly, upbeat, and emotional. She wanted to see the world, wanted to have experiences. 9S's operator is the opposite. She's more closed off, tactical, and ready to direct conversation back to the mission immediately. As 9S, we fly through the factory and begin to take out its defenses. Here, we're also introduced to the hacking minigame that will represent a large change for the gameplay of 9S. 9S can hack enemies, which can allow us to take them over and control them if they're weak enough, or just damage them if we so choose. He can also hack larger enemies, which will damage them. Each of these minigames mostly sees us trying to destroy a black sphere at the center. The more difficult ones require us to first destroy other defenses to reveal the sphere before taking it out. This can be useful for a multitude of different reasons. Some stronger enemies can be hacked to open them up for attacks, or just to get some more reliable damage on them. I didn't really take enemies over too much outside of the times when it was necessary for the story, though. 9S can also hack chests around the world. We could see these chests during our first playthrough, but couldn't do anything with them until now. 9S will also have to hack many different things just based around the story, which we'll see as we get further into his playthrough. As we destroy the defenses of the machine base, we eventually rendezvous with 2B as she is fighting the Mark's arm. We head forward to help her destroy the Goliath she's looking for and end up defeating more waves of enemies. As we fight the Goliath, we begin to hack into it to use its systems against it, assisting 2B in the process. As you can see, this playthrough will fully show us the other side of what we experienced before. We will be seeing the whole story from 9S's perspective, not just the character's emotions in the story. 9S is of course damaged during the battle and forced to manually reactivate all of his systems. 9S tells 2B to leave him behind and offers her his flight suit. We then have to use our pod to hold off the machine forces attacking 9S as he is laying near dead on the ground. We then help 2B hack into the enemy's arm. The two then make the decision to self-destruct and take out the Goliaths. We then play as 9S back on the bunker, mostly reinstated. We then head to 2B to check in for her regular maintenance. We see the recording from before, the one of us adjusting settings at the beginning of our first playthrough. Such a genius little trick here that the game does, but the sequence was actually being recorded. It wasn't just for show. We are now seeing our inputs as the other character through 9S's eyes. This is such a small moment in the game, but one that really fully tells the player that they are controlling someone else. This fully cements the idea that we will be seeing the story through another's eyes, as we are seeing what we've literally done before through 9S. I love it. The two then head to the commander who tasks them with heading to Earth and checking into the resistance camp. When we meet Anemone, she seems to already know 2B, at least at first. We're tasked with heading into the desert once again, and we find the machine that runs. This time, though, we see a storybook. It tells a story of a volcano eruption, a god emerging from the fire. The god told the machines of emotion, the meaning of life. We then make our way into the desert once again and defeat Adam. We alert command and once again head back into the resistance camp. On our way to the amusement park, we get another new scene. One of the two pods talking. The ones that help and follow 9S and 2B. They are now exchanging combat data between each other for efficiency. As we enter the amusement park, we also see another storybook. They were found by the machines. The machines called them treasures. Each treasure had a different shape. Each treasure had a different shape. We once again enter the facility and face off against Beauvoir. But this time, halfway through the fight, we see memories. A machine, called Beauvoir, wants to be beautiful and thinks that adding more adornments will achieve that. We then get a novel section at the end of the battle. This machine that we've fought wants to be beautiful for someone else. It bases its concept of beauty off of the research of old human ideals, pretty skin, nice clothes. 
The machine searches for a jewel that will make it beautiful and eventually resorts to consuming androids to try and become more pretty. It doesn't work, and the machine is left alone. We once again leave and head toward Pascal's village. On the way, we see Adam and Eve talking. Eve wonders why they do the things they do, why they wear undergarments and eat apples. The things they do are also based on what the humans of the old world did. Adam specifically says that humans gained great intelligence from eating fruit, clearly a misreading of the book of Genesis. We return to the resistance camp and make the delivery for Pascal before dealing with Goliaths in the city ruins. The Goliath makes the crater, and we head to investigate the alien ruins, where we fight Adam and Eve once again. This time, as 9S, we actually fight Adam instead of Eve, which I thought was a good touch. We see another storybook depicting a machine repeating the same phrases over and over. I killed my father, I killed my mother. We end up speaking with Pascal once again, who sends us to the Forest Kingdom. We meet Emil and begin to see flashbacks to the creation of the kingdom. The machines there were urged to create a group, something like a family. This furthers the idea that the machines did not know what they were doing, and most likely still don't. They just do it because that is what they understand. We once again defeat A2 and leave the castle. Before asking Pascal about her, we see another scene, a baby being risen up by machines. We're then tasked with helping out the missile supply mission again. Eve is tired of reading, but Adam tells him that just transferring the data would not put the information into his heart like reading would. Eve is more focused on having fun, learning is boring to him. Adam seems like the more responsible figure, wanting to learn, adapt, and get better to complete their mission. We once again have to fight the large machine in the water, but this time the second half goes a little different. Controlling 9S, we actually have to maneuver the weapon that's launched at the enemy. We see another storybook and a conversation between the pods. They want to share situational data now more regularly. We're now controlling 9S after the blast. He's maneuvering through a digital maze, trying to gain his memories back, trying to hang on to the him that was him. Inside this, though, 9S begins to find the machine's records. They were studying politics, philosophies, everything they could from humankind. But the machines never created anything new, never started anything, just imitated human behavior. They even fail repeatedly. They try something, and if it fails, then they try it again in the exact same way. Adam tries to convert us through this to the side of hatred, to the side of violence. The next storybook ties the treasure theme from before back to Adam. Treasured family above all else. Another treasured its older sibling. Another treasured its own beauty. But one more machine treasured something unique above all else. Hate. We see this just as Adam is being killed by 2B. We once again are rescued by 2B and have to try and regain 9S's memories. This time, though, he accesses the main server. Here, he finds quite a few interesting records. Some tell him that the shipping containers sending supplies to the moon were empty, that android bodies had been lost, and finally, a record about how the Council of Humanity was formed as a part of Project Yorha. This doesn't make sense, though, because Yorha should have been created by humanity, not the other way around. 2B then makes a backup request and we have to get out. This point is where we assist 2B in the factory. We have to take control of different machines by hacking them and making our way through the facility. Eventually, we track all the way backwards and let 2B inside. We also have to open the gates for her, which allows us to find some interesting Project Gestalt reports on the server. These talk of a red dragon and the rise of white chlorination syndrome. We then play a hacking minigame to help 2B get the shield down for the boss we fought earlier. 9S confronts the commander about the records he found on the server. She confirms 9S's worst fears. Mankind has been extinct for a long time. Humans never made it to the moon. A server was installed on the surface to make it look like they were alive. Humans were already gone when the aliens attacked. The commander says that this is all to give the androids a reason to fight. We then see Eve grieving over the loss of his brother. There's an all alert at the bunker and 9S escapes back to Earth to assist in helping out 2B. We fight Eve a few different times once again and have to hack him in the final battle. We have to chase him through different sections before arriving at a house with Eve's memories. He wanted to travel to a home, somewhere quiet with him, but clearly this didn't happen. We defeat Eve once more and 2B kills 9S. This time, there are some hologram girls standing by. 9S, of course, comes back once again. This ending is or not to be. 
During the credits, we play as 2B once again and head to 9S's room. He gives us some items and is about to say something before telling us to be careful on our mission. We then head to our own room and see a preview of the next two endings. I do really enjoy this playthrough of Automata, mostly because it once again allows us to see another side to things. It really reminds me of Nier in many different ways. I think that there's a lot more here than in Nier though, and the next playthrough will definitely solidify it as its own different concept, but this does a lot that the previous game did. 9S is also my favorite character to play in the game, so getting to play through it with him is always a treat. The best thing this playthrough does though is break down our preconceived notions thematically. I view the way that Yokotaro creates stories as a fight. The player from the beginning always has their guard up. This is not exclusive to Yokotaro games either. Anytime we play a game or experience a story, our hands are in front of our face. We're used to being lied to, used to being twisted on. We expect something coming, but at the same time, we generally take what the story says at face value, unless there's a reason to mistrust the person telling it to us. The goal of the storyteller in my eyes is to get the player to let down their guard so they can deliver a hook to the jaw. This ultimately is what most want from a story, especially in a genre like this, to be knocked out. The only way to pull down the barriers, though, is to break down what the player believes. Here, Taro almost establishes the guard through the first playthrough. He tells us that we are warring with the machines, that the machines are weapons of an alien race, that they have no feelings. But at the same time, we are told that not all machines are bad. Some are good and helpful and kind. But truly, at the end of the day, the machines are only basing their personalities and habits off of human data. That's all they can do. And in the second playthrough, we're also told that these machines have lives, that they genuinely do believe they have families and care for others. The other thing we haven't really talked about is machine and android. The definition of a machine is a mechanically, electrically, or electronically operated device for performing a task. A very technical definition, a methodical one, no room for emotion here. The definition of an android is a mobile robot, usually with a human form. Again, a technical definition with very little room for emotion. Now, obviously there is reason for a difference here, especially because a machine can be many things, including a generator, and is not always a walking humanoid attempting to be a human, but humor me here. When I started the game, my immediate thought was that it's quite ironic that 9S speaks so low of the machines when androids are technically machines themselves. In our mind, as a player from the real world, both of these things are really robots. They are humanoid things made of equipment, steel and wires and mechanics. They have no soul, not truly. They are not like us. They don't have hearts. From an outsider's perspective, we see them as the same. Not only are they both mechanical and far from organic, they are both weapons that were made to fight a war that isn't theirs. Sure, the androids feel a little more than the machines do and seemingly don't base their actions off of human record, but that's not entirely true either. When you're not looking at this situation from the outside, it becomes a lot easier to see the distinction. The androids themselves believe that they were created for a purpose, to fight the machines and eventually defeat the aliens, taking back Earth for the humans. They are more advanced than the machines that they fight. They have feelings. They don't just mindlessly wander around, repeating the same events over and over. They aren't quite human, but they are closer to human than machines. When we find out that the aliens are dead, we realize that, at this point, the androids are fighting a war against the machines for the humans. When we find out the humans are dead, we realize that the androids are fighting a meaningless war against the machines for nothing. They are fighting other beings just like them, with almost no difference, for no one else but themselves, for just the point of war. This is Taro breaking down our guard, pulling down our hands so he can deliver a knockout punch. We'll get back to these points later, but it feels important to establish these themes here, because they are a current that runs through this game. Once we obtain ending B, we can start the game once again and work on ending C. This is not a retread of what we've seen before, like ending B. This part of the game actually begins after ending A and B. The machine's chain of command have been thrown into chaos after the death of Adam and Eve. Because of this, Yorha has decided to launch an all-out attack on the machines, taking this opportunity to strike the weakened enemy. 2B is now suited up in a military outfit. 
We then get to play as 9S down on Earth. We'll be swapping back and forth between characters for just about the rest of the game. The scanners are now tasked with hacking into the anti-air systems to get ready for the assault. We have to hack into different machines around the area. We then control 2B and head down to the ruins where we begin the assault against the machines. It doesn't work out like we expected though as the enemies begin to start multiplying. We join up with some other squadrons and have to fight many machines that have EMP fields around them. These fields can take out our sight systems or even our ability to fight. Once we defeat them, the Yorha soldiers fighting with us begin to writhe in pain. We manage to save 2B, but the rest are infected with a logic virus. We have to fight off the Yorha soldiers attacking us. The two are attacked and decide to once again self-destruct their black boxes. Back on the bunker, the commander thinks our claims are ludicrous, but the virus begins to infect the soldiers on the station as well. The bunker is taken over and we have to fight our way out. Once we escape, the commander sacrifices herself to let us leave, and we head back to Earth, now cut off from the bunker for good. During this, we see a full, almost opening credits sequence for Automata, as if this is just the beginning. 2B and 9S are separated on their descent, and 2B is infected with the logic virus. She can't use any of her systems, and we see a bar slowly tick up as she is fully taken over. We make it just to the shopping center before two androids fall upon us like moths to a flame. Just then, A2 arrives and we control her as we save 2B from them. But 2B realizes the futility of her position as her eyes begin to turn red. We then head to 2B's position as 9S, and he sees her killed by A2's sword. She then cuts her own hair off, and 9S screams out, rushing toward the android before falling into the cavern below. Because the androids are cut off from the bunker, this is a true death. There's no coming back from this one. And just before that, she finally called him Nines. I'll kill you! Massive towers begin to rise around the world, and we see the title of the game once more. We then see the two pods from before talking once again. They confirm that both A2 and 9S are ready for reactivation. Their only course of action left is to support the remaining androids, as they are what is left of Yorha. We then have a choice, whether we want to support 9S or A2. We will see both of their stories in the end, this just determines in which order we will experience them. We'll talk about 9S's story first. I should point out here that a very large gameplay change has now taken effect for both of our characters that will stay for the rest of the game. The system that was present in the beginning when we die, our body sticks around and we can pick up all our items again, is gone because the bunker is gone. The androids can no longer upload their data to another body. If they die, they're just dead. This clearly has story implications as well, but it also changes the way we play the game. When we die, we have to restart from a save. We don't keep the slight progress we made along the way. It changes the way we play the game, but it also changes the way that the characters act in the story. They're now a lot less safe and should be less reckless. 9S wakes up back in the resistance camp overseen by Devola and Popola. He was rescued by the twins after his fall. He puts his visor back on and figures out that he's been gone for two weeks. The twins say that there used to be more of their models in the past, but now the records from that era are deleted, and their model went berserk a long time ago, so they aren't sure what happened. When we head out of the resistance camp, we see the massive structures that have popped up from underground. The center seems to have some sort of elevator, and our new goal is to head forward and hack it. I should also point out that as 2B was descending to Earth, she left a message for 9S. If anyone is listening to this, there's something I need you to do. If you ever meet up with your unit 9S, I want him. I mean, I'm sorry. Please just give him the following message, 9S. The time I was able to spend with you, it was like memories of pure light. Thank you. Once we try to hack the tower, we can't get access. It seems to be inviting us in, though, with an announcement system over a loudspeaker. We need special authorization, which we have to get from different towers throughout the area. 
9S's goal here, though, is to get access to the Mystery Tower, but also to find A2 and kill her. He wants revenge for the death of 2B. He didn't realize that she was infected and clearly thinks the murder was in cold blood. He would have had to do the same in that situation, but wasn't yet aware of all the details. He heads to the first tower in the Forest Kingdom. There's angelic writing outside that says Meat Box. Each level of this tower will challenge us with defeating groups of enemies. It gets harder and harder as we move up the building. Once we reach the top, we find a core that's powering the place. 9S destroys this, and we get the access key for one of the towers in the crater. A machine nearby is begging to be killed, heavily injured, and wants to be put out of its misery. 9S obliges, taking his anger for the machines out on this one. At this point, we can switch to A2 to see her side of the story during this same time, but we'll finish up 9S's story first. 9S then heads to the flooded city to find another tower standing off to the side. This one has writing that says Soul Box above its entrance. This tower requires us to complete hacking puzzles on each level. We can find many different optional reports on our way up. One of the most interesting ones we can find details Project Yorha. Specifically, it talks about the fact that the black boxes, the core of the androids, are actually created from reused cores of machines. This effectively breaks down the final barrier between the machines and the androids. Not only are they similar from the outside looking in, they are made of the same material. When we arrive at the top of the tower, we have another hacking section. This time we're actually playing 9S, and we head to another platform to find 2B, or at least her memory. 9S's memories of her are surrounding us on holographic screens. 9S has to do this, of course, but he doesn't want to. He fights 2B and kills her, stabbing her lifeless body over and over, only to reveal that he's stabbing the core. 9S gets the second key to the towers, and we see the pods speaking again. They are worried about 9S's mental state. We then switch over to A2. She wakes up in the city and is assisted by pod 042. She doesn't want the help, but can't override the order. A2's goal is a little different from 9S. She really just wants to kill every machine she can, wiping them out. We head to the desert, and there we immediately contend with a boss named Hegel. Before we talk about Hegel, we should talk about the way that A2 plays, because she also has a huge shift in gameplay. She has an additional ability called Berserk, which replaces A2 and 9S's self-destruct. Normally, with those characters, we can hold down a button and cause them to explode, bringing their health to zero, but damaging enemies in a radius around them. A2 can do the same thing, but go into Berserk mode instead. This increases her damage output by a lot, and also increases the damage she receives. Her health will slowly deplete while Berserk Mode is active until she's at 1 HP, at which point Berserk Mode will end. Of course, there is an easy way to use this to our advantage. We can just equip very good auto-heal chips to extend Berserk Mode and do a ton of damage to enemies. It's a very useful skill and makes boss battles an incredibly simple task. A2's taunt is also changed. She no longer has to rely on the pod's light to do it for her. It's a much better and reliable taunt than the one that the previous characters used, mostly because it has a better range. Overall, A2 is incredibly powerful to use, and her upgrades and changes feel a lot more true to her character. Defeating Hegel is pretty simple. He is a mass of different spheres that will disconnect themselves and attack us in all different directions. We have to destroy each of the spheres to take him down. Once we defeat the machine, we are attacked with an EMP blast. This causes damage to A2's memories. The enemy's memories have begun to merge with hers, and we also find 2B's memory data inside. We see some short snippets of A2's memories as well, someone thanking her for her help. She then destroys a memory that cries for its mother, and a wisp of 2B tries to tell her that they are the same, but she rejects this, returning to the real world. The pods once again share information on A2's memory. Because A2 pushed herself in battle so hard, she needs to replace some parts and heads to the resistance camp. Outside, Pascal is being attacked and we save the machine. Once we talk to Anemone, we realize that she already knows A2. A2 tells her of 2B's fate. A2 is also resistant to the idea that the camp is trading with Pascal. She then tells A2 that she stored the memories of their times together on a computer behind her. We can go here to view these memories and get a novel of the backstory of Anemone and A2. This story takes place years ago during massive battles that Anemone's squad was part of. They were older android models, and when fighting in the machine war, they ended up coming across some new models, which A2 was a part of. The groups eventually bond, become friends, and learn to help each other out. 
One of the older androids, Lily, is taken over by a logic virus, and they manage to save her from it. The rest of her squad dies in a mission where they are overtaken by machines. Anemone is the only one from her squad to survive. A2 did survive in the end as well, but she was branded a traitor by the commander. Our new goal is to head to Pascal's village. If we help them out, then we can get the oil filter we need to fix A2. We get the materials and we do a favor for Pascal in return. There's a machine that's been attacking the children below and we defeat it. We leave and deliver supplies to Anemone before heading back to Pascal's village. Before we get there, we see him teaching the children of the village to grow up well. Pascal cares about their future, cares about shaping them in a way that will mean well for them. It should also be pointed out here that Pascal is interested in philosophy. This is an interesting point because, as you may already know, there are many characters in Nier named after philosophical figures. There's a ton of obvious ones like Jean-Paul, a philosopher machine that people have begun to follow in Pascal's village. He's clearly named after Jean-Paul Sartre, a philosopher famed for writing nausea and being and nothingness. He posited the idea that everything we do as humans reflects what we think they should be, or I am what I do. Pascal himself is named after Blaise Pascal, who wrote the Pensée. He originally was trying to bring readers of his philosophy to God by creating the most futile picture of life on earth that he could. Beauvoir is named after Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote The Second Sex. She was heavily focused on gender and tried to break down what gender meant as a birthright. Boss is named after Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Hegel, Kierkegaard, even Kant all make an appearance here. But to what end? Well, the philosophers these characters are named after basically are the philosophers themselves. Beauvoir is warning on focusing too much on beauty standards and what it means to be a woman. Pascal warns of living in fear. Marx and Engels are the literal means of production, giant machines that produce in a factory, named after the communists advocating for seizing the means of production. But there is one thing that has always plagued me. These machines are copying the behaviors left over in their records of these humans. This has always begged the question, is the game critical of philosophy, or is it in favor of deeper thought? In my mind, it seems to posit the idea that even the philosophers of this world are based on something else, doomed to repeat the same cycles over and over again. That at the end of the day, the high-minded thinkers are still the same as the androids and the machines. Now that we've learned androids are essentially at their core, machines. Pascal himself criticizes Nietzsche while he reads it. There's also the machines that we can find from around the world, intelligent ones that have thought so hard they've decided to throw themselves from high places, taking their own lives. I think this ends up being another open end left by Yoko Taro, one that we are left to interpret. I usually land on the critical end, that philosophy is ultimately impractical. This doesn't go on to say that we shouldn't think about deeper things. We should, and I think Automata itself does this, but the game does seem to point in the direction of criticizing those high-minded individuals in its world's past, because at the end of the day, look at what has become of that very same world. After we see Pascal, we are asked to come to the village because it's in great trouble. We head there to see it on fire, and the machines have begun eating each other. We have to take out the machines in the village and destroy everything in sight. Pascal made it out to the abandoned factory with the children, but everyone else is gone. We head to the factory and meet up with him. Pascal says that they usually store their cores in safe places so that if machines die, they can be regenerated. This time, though, their cores were destroyed, along with their bodies, meaning there is no coming back, but at least the children made it out alive. Soon afterward, we are attacked by the rabid machines. We head outside to defend the place and make sure the children survive. Pascal then takes control of a massive Goliath and defeats hordes of machines coming at us. We get to fight another Goliath from a side view, and possibly the most grandiose scene in the game. We defeat the machine and return to the children, only to find them all dead. They took their own lives. This is because Pascal taught them about the concept of fear. He did this to protect them, but this caused them to take their own lives. Pascal then asks us to make a decision. He wants us to erase his memories, and if we can't do that, then he wants us to kill him. This choice doesn't have a huge effect on the story. It will either give us him as a vendor later in the game or not. I chose to delete his memories, though. He was good enough that he still deserved to live on, but I didn't want him to have to live with that. As we delete each of his memories, we hear them ringing out, and this is a difficult affair, not in gameplay, but in will. Having to destroy the fond memories that Pascal has of his time in the village and with the children is very hard, but we know that it's a good thing. 
We then see the pods talking once again. The enemy machines have begun sharing data. In addition, 9S's psychological state has begun to deteriorate even further. We jump back to 9S at this point. His lack of maintenance and rest has left him with a lack of system usage. We have to limp our way to the resistance camp. Once we get there, Devola and Popola come to our aid. After getting repaired, we head to the last tower in the amusement park. This one has God Box written above it. I should note here that 9S's deteriorating psychological state that the pods talk about has happened slowly over the course of the game. Of course, when we first saw him, he was mistrusting of machines, but it wasn't any more than your normal android. He is at war with them. It only makes sense, but now he hates them. There is a disdain in his voice, an anger, a hatred, a pure fury. He wants revenge, and he will do anything to get it. At this point, we will begin to jump back and forth between 9S and A2 for the rest of the game. A2 begins to hear the announcements from the tower and heads over there. 9S makes his way up the tower, and we meet Operator 21-0. 9S developed a great relationship and attachment to the Operator over the course of his journeys. Of course, as I said before, she acts as a mirror to him, just as 2B's Operator acted as a mirror to her. She pushed down his more upbeat demeanor and even rejected his advances. Now she shows up here to take him out. This boss was kind of annoying for me. There are two spinning lines of spheres in front of us with small weak points that we have to attack. We also have to dodge projectiles and lasers that alternate. As we deal damage though, the attacks get faster and the weak points spin quicker. It becomes harder to hit as we go on, making it pretty difficult to get shots in. Eventually 210 attacks us herself. She has clearly been taken over by the logic virus. She reveals her personality through the battle, that she was lonely and just wanted a family to be with. She gets up once again, but A2 arrives to defeat her. She then relays the message from 2B, that she wanted 9S to become a good person. This angers him, and he falls below. A2 then has to defeat Augusta. This boss is pretty simple, we just dodge the bouncing balls and do a ton of damage to the boss. When we defeat it, the machines mourn its passing and seem to bow to A2 as their new brother. A2 destroys them all in one fell swoop, though. We then see a text conversation between the two pods. They have begun using alternate methods to communicate out of concern for transmission interference. This means they're communicating on our loading screen. The pods now have feelings towards the ones that they were meant to protect, 2B, 9S, and A2. They wonder if this is their will, their self-determination. Even the pods seem to have some sort of feeling, some sort of awareness, making them no less than the androids or the machines. Pod 42 tells 153 to not die. 9S wakes up outside of the amusement park. His systems have been reactivated, and he seems to have a much more monotone voice. The care and emotion in him is gone. We now have the third key, though, so it's time to visit the big tower in the crater. Before we do this, we've recovered the data records for Devola and Popola. We get a novel that tells us their backstory. After the fallout of Project Gestalt, the future models were programmed to feel intense guilt for failing humanity. This is the burden that the twins carry moving forward. Half of their story takes place as the two struggle to survive out in the wilds and are injured. At the resistance camp, the twins were shunned and constantly given the hardest tasks, but this is their assignment, the fate that they both are left to. The two help us enter the tower and sacrifice themselves in doing so. Once we arrive in the tower and begin to make our way to the top, we are assaulted by hostile androids. We eventually arrive in a room full of 2Bs and 9S has a full breakdown. He takes off his mask and destroys all of the androids in front of him. <sighs> <laughs> I'm glad I got to see you here. I truly am. I'll tear you apart. Every last one of you! A2 then enters the tower herself. She heads to the top and eventually finds a recreation of a library, the same one from near that existed in the village. A lot of information inside feeds back into Project Gestalt, but A2 finds something relating to model number two. A boss then crashes into the facility and 9S is waking up from his fall. He holds a dead 2B in his arms and then fights off a virus in his system. We then are confronted with the girl holograms from before. They want to test us before they give us the information that we seek. 
Once we defeat the enemies in front of us, we're given a piece of data, and one of the best shots in the entire series. This part really focuses on how grotesque 9S has begun to look. You can see that he's lost his mind in his eyes. The document that he has shown is a disposal record, one that not even the commander was exposed to. Yorha was supposed to be disposed of, the bunker was to be attacked, and all the old models were to be replaced with new ones so that the records could be destroyed and they could create the idea that humanity still lived on the moon. All of the androids, including 9S himself, were disposable. They weren't meant to fight, they were meant to be replaced. We fight some Yorha flight units and take one of our own. A2 then contends with Koshi, another massive spider sphere boss in the library. We are then hacked by the girls in red and forced to contend with them in a digital space. They begin to multiply though, and the pod eventually helps us realize that if we stop fighting, they will multiply until they begin to fight each other, destroying themselves in the process. We then have one of my favorite sequences in the game. 9S fights Roshi, while A2 fights Koshi. Here we swap back and forth constantly to each character, fighting one in the sky and the other on the ground. This is such a great battle because the entire game has been building up to this. We've been switching characters for a while now, and it's gotten so fast that it's in the middle of almost the same fight. It even mirrors the journey that the two characters have had up to this point. We then fight the bosses together as they have joined into one being, swapping back and forth between 9S and A2. Once we destroy the beast, there are just two androids left. 9S and A2 are at an impasse. They are ideologically opposed. Only one of them can come out of this alive. The tower that they stand in is a giant cannon aimed directly at the moon. It is meant to take out the servers that hold the human genome. 9S has begun to be taken over by the logic virus at this point. He's vengeful and full of that fury that we talked about before. He wants to kill A2 and wipe out the machines, as well as the server on the moon. Burn it all down. A2, however, has 2B's memories inside of her. She tells 9S that 2B was actually called 2E. She was not a battler unit. She was an executioner unit. 9S was inquisitive and curious, and because of this, he would always end up finding out the truth about Yorha. The executioner was made to kill 9S whenever he got too close to figuring things out. This angers 9S, and we have a choice. We can decide to play as A2 and kill 9S, or vice versa. Choosing A2 will give us ending C for near automata. A2 severs his arm and hacks into his systems. A2 begins to wipe the virus from his systems, telling her pod to take care of him after she's gone. A2 is left in the tower, and she seems to destroy it as it comes crumbling down around her. Afterwards, we see a moose wandering in the forest when it spots a familiar sword stabbed into a rock. Ending D occurs when we choose 9S during the final battle. This is a side-scroller battle, so the gameplay is changed here just slightly. 9S runs A2 through with a sword, but he falls on her sword in turn. He writhes in pain as he bleeds out. Afterwards, we see a novel, some of 9S's memories, the moment that he was manufactured, his reflections on loneliness, and eventually getting to meet 2B. It is eventually revealed that this tower is not a cannon, but an ark. The machines created to find a new planet to inhabit, and 9S is offered to join them. We can make this choice, and then watch as the inhabitants of Earth see the ark leave the planet behind. This is childhood's end, ending D of Near Automata. Before we talk about ending E, the final ending of the main story, I'd like to talk about the novel sections for a moment. These text sections were present in Nier and are actually a lot more sparse here than in the first game, but I do think that this works better. These text sections are chosen sparingly and are only present in moments when it delivers a harder emotional punch. During my research, I've also seen a lot of people that don't like them or say they feel unnecessary. I couldn't really find a way to articulate my argument against this until I played Automata. Think about your favorite book, a story that you've read many times and really cherished. One day it's announced that this book has a Netflix adaptation coming. When it releases, it's very bad, and you can't really point out why. The obvious reason here is that some things are better left to the imagination. This is true, certain things look better in your head, and when you're allowed to extrapolate on them in your mind, they turn out a lot more fantastical than you could ever see them on a screen. But there's another reason. Sometimes things just work better in text. Sometimes more emotion comes from the words on the screen than an actor's performance could ever give it. This is no better shown than when we see 9S's reflection. It was like I had a family. 
This text on the screen, isolated, set to a white background, staring at us, hits much harder than this scene would if it was read out. But with that, we've completed four of the endings of Nier Automata. We have only one left. Once we have completed ending C and D, the credits of the most recent ending we completed will be unskippable. This is because pod 042 and 153 will begin speaking to each other during this sequence. Through the conversation, the two pods realize that the final black box is offline, that the Yorha project has concluded. A data leak begins, causing the memories of 2B, 9S, and A2 to be deleted. Pod 042 feels a massive gratitude towards these androids because they were the ones that allowed him to be able to develop what he calls a will in the first place. He then begins a data salvage to preserve the memories of those lost. In response, a system purge begins. This could cause the end of the pod's consciousness. We have to prevent this purge by playing one last shoot 'em up minigame, but this time we're defeating the credits. We're wiping out the names of the people that created the masterpiece that we're playing right now. This ending is fantastic in so many ways. First of all, I just want to appreciate the level of ingenuity that it takes to get us to interface with the credits like this. Getting people to watch credits is a very difficult thing. Most people just skip them and rarely care about the names behind the game that they just played. Some games will go as far as to force you to watch the credits, not allowing you to skip at all. I don't think this is a good solution whatsoever, because it really just makes the player annoyed and uninterested. This sequence actually makes us care about the names and pay attention to them, but that is the very smallest thing it does. As we move on, the game becomes incredibly difficult. It gets harder and harder to survive as the bullets are flying around the screen. We are asked multiple times if we want to stop, if we want to quit, if everything is all for nothing. Pointless. But the messages begin to grace our screen, one of encouragement. We will soon learn that these are from other players that have completed the process already and were allowed to leave messages for us to cheer us on, to keep us going. Not only that, but the minigame will become so hard at a certain point that we need to accept help from these other people. More shooters will flood the screen and allow us to take more hits and defeat the credits easier. Not only is this just incredibly wholesome, it's just a perfect crescendo to the end of this experience. After toiling for hours in a bleak landscape of death and misery, wondering if life even matters, we are given the joy of community, the support of others, the message that we must lean on someone to get through and bear this wretched landscape of life. After we reach the end, we hear one of the pods saying that everything is designed to end, that life is the struggle. The pods now fully have feelings. One of the pods has survivor's guilt. They have developed abstract concepts, though they are still machines. The data salvage restored all of the androids' memories, and they are reassembling them with the same design. We see 9S and 2B on a rooftop, ready to come back and try this whole thing once again, and A2 off in the distance. The pods question whether this is pointless, whether trying this over one more time might be futile. It might just lead to the same result, but there is hope. There is a small possibility of a different outcome, and because of that, they have to try. After this scene, we can choose to delete our save data to provide a message to the other players trying to finish the game. This whole sequence is just beautiful. Yokotaro made a happy ending here, and it was really shocking to see. Judging from his track record, he really only focuses on the bleak, the tired, the weary, and the hopeless. But here, he inspires hope. To be honest, it is an open ending, and I could see how you could interpret this ending as futile, nihilistic, the same cycle of life, death, and failure over and over. But I would argue that the game is telling us that this is the point. That this is the point of everything, to try again and fail over and over. Not until you succeed, because success isn't the point. The point is in the trying. Upon watching the final scene, I couldn't help but think back to the records of the androids that 9S had found, the ones detailing that they based their personalities and habits on human behavior. If something didn't work, they just tried it again, in the same way, and never adapted. I would argue that this is the most human thing that they could have done, making the machines the most human of all. This still isn't truly the end of Nier Automata. 
there are still some adventures to be had in this world. And this game is actually the most friendly to going back and picking it up again, as there's actually a post game. We can go back to the game through chapter select, and we still keep our levels, weapons, chips, and items. We can also, of course, go back and do any side content that we missed. One of the biggest things that we can do first is fighting the secret bosses. This will only happen when Emil invites us back to his home. He does this the first time that we meet him to get access to his shop. We can find his home connected to the crater in the city ruins. There are different levels to this place, but Emil's home is at the bottom. Once we get there, we can find some interesting stuff, specifically a mask that we can take. When we talk to Emil on the surface, he says that someone has been stealing his stuff, so he's locked it in a chest. We can head down again to hack the chest and grab one of Emil's heads. When we go to leave, Emil realizes that it was us and decides to defend his home. We have to battle him, but if we do this after the main story, it isn't really a challenge. This gives us the Emil Heads weapon. The only other secret boss after this requires a lot of work to get to. We have to first collect every single weapon in the game. This will be a lot of backtracking to other chapters and completing quests if we weren't gathering them during our original playthroughs. After that, we have to upgrade each one to level 4, which requires a ton of material farming and buying. Once we do this, we can fight Emil in the desert, which is virtually the same fight as Hegel, but just with Emil heads instead. There's some quite disturbing dialogue here, though, that makes it a lot different. If we don't complete the battle, we will get ending Y, which tells us that the Emils caused the planet to explode and destroyed it entirely. If we beat it, then Emil will perish, remembering his companions from before, happy that he gets to see them in the end. There are some particularly interesting side quests in Nier Automata that I'd like to talk about quickly. There are many side quests in the game, and like I said before, some of them really help to flesh out the world and make for a richer story. Yorha Betrayers sees us tracking down some android deserters who are wanted by the organization. As we track them down, we begin to question why they're wanted in the first place. We don't end up getting an answer, but it starts to make us question command, and clearly that was a correct line of thought in the end. There is an interesting quest that has us collect plug-in chips for an android in the resistance camp. We then deliver them to him, only to realize that the android was trying to construct a family out of other machine life forms. This is quite clearly strange to our characters, but in hindsight, it's almost kind of touching. Amnesia is probably one of my favorite quests in the game. We find a resistance woman in the city ruins, and she seems to have lost her memories. She has a pod that belonged to her dead friend, and wants us to find out who killed her. We hack the pod and reveal the perp had a red hood. We track down the red hooded person only to be led back to the resistance woman who gave us the quest. Once we get the final information from the pod, we realize that the woman herself killed her friend. She was a Yorha soldier, a type E executioner. She killed her friend and was racked with guilt, so she wiped her own memories to forget. This obviously foreshadows a lot of things from the story. For one, the existence of type E androids, the designation that we would later learn belongs to 2B and her tragic story, but also the idea of wiping one's memories to forget some guilt, which Pascal would later become a victim of. It is also quite tragic, though, because the character wanted their memories wiped. They wanted to forget, but their curiosity got the better of them, and they're back in the same place they were before. A lot of these quests are really good, and most of them are worth your time. There are some, like the race quests, for example, that aren't really necessary to this story, but can be a little fun challenge. It's just a massive step up in terms of content from previous entries in the series. There was one story-related DLC released for Nier Automata called 3C3C1D1194409278, it was released on May 2nd, 2017 for the PlayStation 4. It adds a bunch of different costumes that serve as references to Nier Replicant, but it also adds three new areas that we can partake in challenges in. The first that we'll venture into is the desert. Here the machines ask us to take part in a few different trials. Each trial has a different rule that we'll have to follow to complete it. Sound familiar? Well, it should, because these machines have based themselves on the kingdom in the desert all those years ago in Nier. They follow specific rules because they believe it will lead their lives and society down a better path. After we complete each one, we get a storybook. This deals with the balance between rules, or chains, and freedom. We can venture to another arena in the flooded city, which will see us completing challenges against formidable foes. Through this one, though, we are shown a magnified version of how machines are treated by androids, forced to fight, forced to be slaves and do their bidding, and when they don't act correctly, they are tortured or killed. 
The storybook contains the fitting quote that to consider someone else a friend is to consider someone else an enemy. The last one takes place in the Forest Kingdom and sees us taking control of machines to fight against others. This one offers us the machines that we've already taken control of throughout the game. This one shows off the struggle of a machine to become stronger. After this, we can find our final challenge to journey through the memories of a machine named Plato. 17 to 8. It details his struggle, his failure to be good enough, to always be worse than everyone around him. This again furthers the idea that this is what it means to be human. The DLC also allows us to take on some extra challenges at each of the game arenas. In one, we can even battle the CEO of Square Enix and the CEO of Platinum Games. I do think this DLC was interesting and probably warranted. It was a good implementation of the medium. It wasn't an extension to the story, at least not directly, but it furthers the world so much and extends the style and the storytelling more than anything else. It doesn't need to tell us more about the story or the characters, that part is done. It gives us more good combat and more context to the place that these stories are being told in. Before we move on, I'd like to talk about the music of Nier Automata. I gave this part its own section because I really do think the music is something special, just like in Nier and it deserves to be focused on. The whole soundtrack is gorgeous and is a lot more varied than the previous ones. There's a lot of different sounds here to accommodate for the different environments of the game. I will say that there is still that thread of sadness in most of the songs. The entire project does really feel melancholic, a deep tragedy bleeding through the entire thing. But of course it wouldn't be a Yoko Taro project without it. One of the most recognizable tracks for me is the amusement park theme. This track is just as noticeable the first time you hear it. It's one of those songs that you feel like you've already heard before. The slow thumping piano offers an almost foreboding element to the track. The whole thing is beautiful but with this undercurrent of threat, fear, and danger. The flittering tones at the beginning give the song a whimsical feel as well, and it fits perfectly with its environment. <laughs> When you listen to this song, you can't help but picture the cramped streets of the park and the weaving roller coaster, fireworks in the background. The Weight of the World is perhaps one of the most sad songs on the track list. The guitar and piano come together in the beginning of the song, working in tandem as a beautiful duo, making magic. There's a melancholy here, a sadness that stands at the forefront. The voices are beautiful. The singing is filled with genuine emotion. A sad ballad that expands past this game and becomes its own piece that can work in any other circumstance. It transcends the medium of game, but also reflects the characters in the game and their story incredibly well. The City Ruins theme is another song that fits its area very well. The high piano stands prominent in the background over the sad vocals. The song feels like it's telling a story of a long lost past, a world that's been lost and lives that were once here. But it also feels like a beginning, a readying for adventure. It feels like purpose, reason, motivation, a sunrise just on the horizon, a new day beginning. Vague Hope is another incredibly sad song. The best part about this track, though, is the beginning piano. The writing here is just incredible. The composers made it truly feel like the instrument itself is speaking, adding another layer to this song. When the song hits its soft crescendo, the drums come in and the thumping reverberates. You feel it deep down. The emotion hits you and a picture is painted in your mind. The Copied City is a pretty special track, as it feels very choral for this OST. It clearly again fits the area that it was composed for. The angelic voices raise the song up, elevating it to new heights. The piano creates an almost anxious melody, one of the unknown and battle to be fought. One that can only end in death, so there's a sadness there as well. The Voice of No Return is one of my favorite tracks, mostly because it opens with a very simple guitar and only vocals to accompany it. It's a very stripped back song, but this is one of the more upbeat tracks in my opinion. 
The voice here is sad, but it really paints a picture of hope, happiness, even an empty field somewhere, the sun shining down. Birth of a Wish is one of the more epic tracks on the OST. The thumping drums and deep voices feel very battle-like. It doesn't feel like a grand war, though. It almost has a covert feeling to it. We can feel through the song that one person is fighting this battle, but against a formidable foe. It's grand, but it's a one-sided type of grandiosity. Possessed by Disease is probably one of the most experimental tracks on the list. There's a lot of moving parts here, almost an overwhelming amount, but the violins and modulated voices at the beginning give the track a science fiction feel, but one that's draped in spirituality. The song results in a massive thumping climax, incorporating all of the elements to create something very large in scale, and some type of beauty in the process. <laughs> Overall, the Near Automata soundtrack is fantastic, just beautiful, and there's not much more I can really say about it. Near Automata is a beautiful piece of work. It begins to transcend even the word game at this point. Not that that is a bad thing. It just rises to something higher, above a form of media. It's just art. The physical parts of the game work incredibly well. We've gotten to a point in the series where the combat is actually very good, and fun enough to play that I keep going back to the game even while writing this review. The systems are something that I just love to interface with, and the tactile feel of the controls makes fighting enemies incredibly satisfying. The depth of the system is something to be praised as well. Coming from such humble beginnings as Drakengard, the fact that the systems have advanced enough to reach this point is astounding. There's so much variety in combos and equipment, in ways that you can play the game or fight the enemies. The game and its systems trust you enough to give you the freedom to fully interface with them. That being said, most of that variety is optional, and only exists if you really want to see it. The complexity isn't necessary, and if you want to interact with Nier on simple terms, then the option is there. This is a perfect balancing act of variety for more inclined players that want that sort of thing, and ease of use for people that just want to see the story. The world is also a highlight in Nier Automata, a sprawling and interesting place with a ton of variety in areas and landscapes. Each place feels unique and like it has its own story behind it. It feels like every color, every plant, every room was designed specifically for the area that we are in. The world itself also has a story to tell. It has progressed much further since we last saw it. There are pieces of that here, and they start to begin to bridge the gap between the previous tales and the one that we're playing now. But obviously, the part of Nier Automata that shines the brightest is its story. On one level, Automata tells a compelling narrative, one of broken people trying to survive. Not only that, but pushing further past that, trying to find out why they should even survive in the first place. 2B is a tragic figure, one that is doomed to take care of the very person that she must kill. She's meant to stop him from finding out the hard and secret truths of the world, but ends up caring about that person more than she wants to kill him. 9S is on the other end of this. He's lonely, he wants someone to care for, and someone to care for him. Once he finds that, he only realizes the betrayal in this, that the world would swipe away this reward from him, one final irony in the tragedy. 9S then stakes his life to get vengeance for 2B's death. This journey is wrought with rage, anger, and fury, but when he reaches his goal, he realizes the ultimate truth, that 2B was meant to kill him. Another tragedy on the other side, but 9S is so lost at this point that it doesn't even matter. A2 as a character has struggled and managed to survive for years after losing everyone that she even came close to caring about. She's now a wall that no emotion is allowed to pass through. She's just trying to do right by what she sees, and when we meet her, do right by 2B. These stories are all interwoven through the narrative backdrop of the machines and the androids. Of course, we have the twists and the turns, realizing the aliens are dead and eventually the humans are both shocks to the system. We don't really see these coming, we don't realize the true futility of this war. But the true ingenuity here is the presentation of the story. This game is the culmination of everything that came before it. It feels like every game in the series was just a prototype for Nier Automata. 
The multiple sides of the same story, the choice and endings, the interactive credit sequence, everything pushes a boundary just slightly. The game pushes just a bit outside of the screen to involve the player into what it's doing. It doesn't force itself into the real world fully, but you can tell there's a few inches of difference between this and some generic AAA blockbuster. But that's where the second, deeper layer of the game comes in. This game asks the player many questions. During research for this video, Yoko Taro said a lot of things about the game's endings and story. The main takeaway, though, was that he wanted it to be open-ended. He wanted fans to interpret what happened, or take away things from the games by making their own decisions. This is a mirror of his ideas relating to the game's systems as well. Freedom and choice creates a better outcome. We come to our own conclusions. We find the narrative within on our own, without the game pushing us in one direction, but just slight guidance. In my opinion, Automata is a story that's truly about hope and what it means to be human. Ultimately, humanity does things that make no sense. From an outside perspective, you could watch humans living their daily lives, trying things over and over, and failing miserably, but still getting back up just to fail again. This is how we feel when we watch the machines, even when the androids watch the machines. But that is what it means to be human. Being human is failure. It is tragedy. It is sadness. It is misery. But it's also happiness. It's fulfillment, satisfaction, and most of all, hope. In the end, that's what we're left with. A happy ending where our characters get another chance to do this thing all over again. Isn't that the best we can hope for? Another chance? Nier Automata was a huge success on release. It sold almost 200,000 copies in Japan during its first week of release, and reached number one on the sales charts. By May 2019, it had sold over 4 million copies worldwide. It was the first massive critical success that Taro was allowed to see. He wouldn't get to immediately bask in the glow because Taro had to start working on stage plays soon after, so he didn't get to soak in the rewards until much later. The game was given positive reviews from most outlets, with its highest score a 90 on Metacritic for the Xbox One version of the game. Famitsu gave the game a near-perfect score, touting its themes and gameplay as its best parts. The game was nominated for tons of awards like Best Storytelling at the Golden Joystick Awards, Best Narrative at the Game Awards, and Game of the Year at the GDC Awards. This would be the last mainline entry in the Drakenir series, but we technically haven't even scratched the surface when it comes to lore, supplementary material, and side games. But we'll talk about that next time. Bye, Dad.